Hello and welcome to the They Can Talk show sponsored by Clever Pet. I'm your host, Rachel Slotkey, and today with me for the last show of the year, uh, we have the Clever Pet CEO and founder, Leo Trottier. Leo, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, so just to start things off, can you tell us about what Clever Pet is and how this company came to be? So Clever Pet started actually back in 2014. We did a, a Kickstarter campaign for a cool device, which we call the Clever Pet Hub. The way that it works is uh, it presents games to dogs to give them something to do during the day. And the games are kind of light patterns and the dog needs to solve little light pattern puzzles and then they get a little bit of food. So in the morning, uh, people would put a little bit of food in the device and then over the course of the day, your dog could learn and be entertained and get a little bit of their food. Um, the, so we did that for a little while. And um, uh, around this time last year, I saw what Christina Hunger was doing with her dog, Stella. And everything we'd learned from uh, working with Clever Pet made it really clear that this changes changed everything, right? We were trying to figure out um, how to understand dogs and cats and animals and other minds better by using cool technology and software and, you know, automated interaction. And I thought it would take us, you know, a decade or two decades and, you know, teams of coders and millions of devices for us to be able to communicate in a sophisticated way with dogs and cats and other animals. And Christina showed us that, well, actually uh, a few buttons uh, can really make all the difference. So I, I actually chatted with her uh, around this time last year. She ended up uh, getting a great book deal. And so we didn't end up working together. But then later on, I started working with you and the other test pilots. Um, and we started trying out different kinds of button arrangements and different kinds of hex tiles to um, figure out a better way or uh, a bunch of cool tools that would help uh, dogs and cats uh, learn how to use these buttons better. So, so Clever Pet was kind of this uh, initial game, you would say, for for animals, and then it evolved into uh, into something larger, obviously. And uh, now there's something called Fluent Pet. Can you tell us a little about a little bit about what that is? Exactly. So, Fluent Pet is a system of buttons and tiles, and uh, we designed it to make it a little bit easier for people to try and teach their dog to express themselves using buttons. Previously, people had been taking uh, taking buttons that they got on Amazon and kind of putting Velcro on the bottom of them and sticking them onto a uh, piece of plywood. And uh, my experience with you know making hardware products helped me you know see exactly that actually you know we could if we made cool tiles, not only would it be a lot easier than you know the Velcro thing that people were doing but it would also uh, maybe allow us to bring some kind of insights from cognitive science about how people organize uh, their learning and memory uh, in order to be able to, you know, make it easier for dogs to remember where words are and learn over time. So is, is that when you kind of linked up with uh, Federico Rosano, who we had on our show uh, a few months ago? Uh, and he's he's spearheading this this research, and that's being done with you. Is that kind of the, how that timeline worked? Great question. So what happened was we uh, actually posted on a couple of the Facebook groups asking for people who were interested in, you know, kind of joining our test pilots group. Sorry, that's I've got a cat yes. here who's um, complaining. Uh, but yeah, they, these are extremely um, vocal cats, oh, as that's they say. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Both of you got to go. Sorry. Um, so yeah, so we posted on both of Facebook groups and mm -hmm. we said, uh, who wants to help? And uh, actually Alexis was one of the first people that we connected with. And uh, she, after we gave her some hex styles to work with, she started her TikTok mm -hmm. account and it, you know, obviously blew up, right? That's kind of why a lot of us are here today. And uh she ended up talking about this website that the test pilots had help, had helped make, theycantalk.org. And uh, on theycantalk.org, we said, are you interested in participating in a, in a bit more of a scientific way of looking at whether dogs are communicating in a way that's kind of 
genuinely interesting from like a cognitive science perspective. And we had thousands of people sign up thanks to that announcement. I think, uh, you know, I think we had just like, just to sign up to kind of be interested, say that they were uh, inclined to participate. And subsequent to that, we ended up giving people these kind of more involved um, intakes. And uh, that's where uh, that's where the whole they can talk kind of research study came out of. Now we've got over 1500 people who have said they want to participate uh, and filled out these comprehensive forms. And uh, we've got a few interesting things coming in the new year about, uh, about kind of continuing that research. And so now you kind of have this community online of all these people, including myself, uh, mm -hmm. who have taught their dogs or animals, cats, whatever, uh, to communicate, you know, using these, these buttons, like I said, I myself also use the learning resources buttons at first um, using, you know, Velcro or whatever. And now we've uh, graduated to the, the fluent pet buttons, which does make it a lot, uh, a lot easier. So you started um, gathering this research and kind of evolving this product to make it easier for consumers like myself uh, to be able to utilize this brand new thing that we can all do in our homes now. Um, so, you know, obviously the research is nowhere near finished, uh, but, <laughs> but based on- We've the, barely begun. <laughs> yeah. Well, so based on the, the progress and the things that you do know so far, we have some, uh, some questions from the community that mm -hmm. have come up. Um, so w what would you say is one of the best ways to uh, introduce Fluent Pet Buttons? Uh, to maybe a puppy versus an older dog? Or I mean, in, in all cases, uh, you want the button to refer to something that your dog is probably already asking you for anyway, right? Because it's a lot easier to tie an existing behavior that your dog is doing to uh, another behavior than it is to kind of both create a new behavior in your dog and, uh, okay, hello. Uh, and tie it to the other behavior. By the way, this is a uh, Jonas. He's got this, um, it's called a bird be safe collar and it makes sure that he doesn't eat birds <laughs> so, they, so they can see him. And then he's also got a coyote collar. To, okay. Not that we're, I mean, they stay in the backyard. They don't go anywhere, but <laughs> so. uh, just in case. Um, so uh, where were we? Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all good. Um, oh yeah, okay, <laughs> teaching dogs. Okay, yeah. right, so we were saying, um, uh, you kind of want to tie it to something your dog is already interested in. Mm -hmm. exactly. uh, so a lot of dogs will say, I want to go outside. And so the one of the first and best uh, buttons is an outside button. I, I was speaking with Alexis and, and, and Christina early on, and both of them said, and these are some two of the most successful uh, teachers, and both of them didn't use food rewards for their dogs using buttons. And I think... Um, your dog is so used to kind of doing things for food rewards and it's kind of like food rewards are connected to a command, right? And what I think might be pretty important for teaching your dog to use buttons and we don't have this totally established in any kind of scientific way, but you kind of want the dogs to not be something you're telling your dog to do, but instead something that your dog is keep using to communicate with you. It's okay. It's like holiday jingles, you know? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's very it's seasonal. Very, it's very seasonal. It's very appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, so starting with the outside button and putting the button beside the door, kind of beside the place where your dog will normally say they want to go outside. And then um, you can, you can do target training ahead of time. So you can teach your dog to kind of touch a stick or uh, a wand and uh, kind of teach them to touch on command. But then um, you probably don't want to give them a food reward for touching the button you want them to touch the button when they want to go outside. And the way you, you kind of teach that is every time you go outside, you press the outside button and then you go outside. You can even maybe press the outside button after you came in, you can say all done outside for instance. Um, and then once your dog is pressing the outside button to go outside uh, kind of in a reliable way and they're doing it in a way that's contextually appropriate, you can tell that they really are doing it because they want to go outside. Then you can add a button like play or all done. Um, probably the button, depending on which button you want to add, uh, might depend on whether your dog's overusing the outside button. If your dog is using the outside button a lot, you might want to add an all done button, like all done outside. Um, on the all other done. hand, 
<laughs> yeah, all that has been very helpful in this household. <laughs> that is for sure. Totally. On the other hand, like if they if they're not overusing the outside button and you know they really like to play, a play button is another great button. The, the reason why a treat button probably isn't the best button to add is you want the button to be a button that your dog can't get uh, can get too much of. So you know they get tired of from playing too much. They might get tired of going outside and inside and outside and inside. Whereas a lot of dogs will eat treats so the cats come home. So this is a really interesting question that just came up in the chat. What would you recommend for a first button for maybe kittens to use or cats who might not be as food motivated? I know you with Clever Pet did teach your, you developed that with your cats. So you you did- Cats teach, and dogs, yeah. Cats and dogs, okay. But you were successful in, in teaching cats how to work for food. So what, what would you recommend as like a first button for maybe a cat parent? That's a really good question. I think the way to think about introducing buttons is to really let your learner guide you. So find a thing that your cat is asking for already. And that will mean paying attention to them closely, watching for you know what they want. My cats really want to get on my lap, as you can probably tell. Okay, that's enough. Uh, they, they really want to uh, you know have attention. And so you could make them ask, you know, do you want, do you want the lap? If you want to get on the lap, like, okay, press lap. Or maybe they really like, they have a favorite mouse toy or anything that they're asking you for is a good, um, a good button to start with. And you would recommend one button at a time? I would recommend starting the first, when you're, when you're first introducing buttons to start with just one button, because they're not just learning the meaning of a button, they're also learning to use a button in order to express something that they need. Uh, then subsequently, and, and we haven't you know, done any good you know, analysis of this, but uh, everything I know about kind of learning suggests that it might be good to actually introduce two buttons at a time, and especially afterward, especially two buttons that have contrasting meanings. So, um, you know, like, uh, Play and all done are two things that kind of one one means go and the other kind of means stop, right? Roughly, and so they're kind of good buttons to introduce uh, maybe at the same time. Um, now and later. Now and later uh, could be good, or if you're going to do a toy, maybe do two toys. And the reason for that is you want to make clear to your learner, uh, you know, earlier on that this button doesn't just mean toy in general, but it means this specific toy rather than that specific toy. And that those kind of category distinctions, uh, near, as, near as I can figure, ascertain, are easier to, are easier to do with, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they, are, they are really possessive. They might need um, some buttons soon. They, they might, yeah. So um, yeah, so these kind of category distinctions are easier to make uh, if you kind of have two buttons within the category rather than, um, rather than like buttons that are you know, uh, in different categories. So speaking of categories, um, can we talk about the board for a second? Mm -hmm. So that that's something that's a big difference between just the learning resources buttons versus the Fluent Pet brand product mm -hmm. uh, is the board. Uh, how can you talk about how that's designed, how it might help the learner put some pieces together? Yeah, the board drew inspiration from uh, this way of organizing words that was first coined, uh, first come up with by uh, this woman, I think uh, Eleanor Fitzgerald. Uh, and so it's called a Fitzgerald key. And the notion behind it was uh, people who like deaf uh, children who might not be great at language could kind of si signal to words in each of the boxes in a particular order in order to make, you know, sentences and that were more likely to be grammatical in English, right? So they can kind of go in one direction and say, you know, I, you know, want food or something. I don't know how I came up with that, but, um, and, and so that was the inspiration. It's, it's a thing that's familiar to a lot of uh, speech language pathologists. Um, and so, you know, given that it was a, a tried and true tool that had been used like successfully, it made sense to kind of base the board on that. Can you explain what the Fitzgerald key is? Yeah, the Fitzgerald key is, uh, it's, imagine if you have a, uh, 
a, a number of kind of boxes uh, that are drawn on on a piece of paper, right? So I don't I think at the time they had electronic sound buttons, but if you had if you had a bunch of kind of larger boxes, and each of the boxes referred to a part of speech. So you had um, you know people, and you had places, and you had uh, actions, and you had modifiers. The within each box, you'd have particular words that belong to that part of speech. And then someone who had trouble speaking, if they could point at words within each of those boxes and then go from box to box and make a sentence that actually was potentially sensible. So, so you would, so it's kind of like, um, who, what, where, when, why, you know, how exactly. you organize that you have your, your yep. verbs, your, your people, your places and Exactly, exactly. And then in our case, so what we're doing is we're, um, we're putting like the, okay, so this is a problem. <laughs> it's very fitting. Yeah, no, there, I don't know what's going on. Anyway, I apologize. So they, uh, uh, in our case, people will organize their buttons. So they have, you know, place uh, people words in one tile, and then they'll have actions. So like mom, play outside, right? And that way your learner can kind of, in the same way that a nonverbal uh, user of an AAC board might, the, your learner could go across the board and make a coherent sentence. The, the other reason to do that though, was that it's a lot easier for people to remember things when they chunk them, right? We don't say that it's the 279th day of the year or the 362nd day of the year, right? We say it's December 28th right? Or December, you know, uh, 25th as the case, maybe. Uh, so we, we group things within larger groups, within larger groups. And that's a lot easier. That's a much easier way to kind of put things into memory and keep them in memory. And, and so having a kind of Cartesian grid layout of buttons to me was, seemed like one of the hardest ways to remember where things, it, to remember kind of where things were, because you'd almost have to count from one corner to the next. And that's a pretty hard thing for dogs to do. And so by kind of putting them in, in within bigger categories, uh, it, it's kind of like, you know, day of the month rather than, you know, number of day in the year. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. It, it definitely, uh, it helps me, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember where the, the buttons are just as much as uh, my dog is. So it definitely organizing it does help. Um, what about when, you know, so that's when you have like the basic, basic, but your, your learner knows quite a few words at that point, if you have multiple uh, hex tiles. What about if you grow beyond the six hex tiles? How would you recommend that kind of layout for expanding? Um, we haven't, you know, figured out an optimal one, but one hypothesis we're running with that seems like it would be sensible would be to have kind of the diagonals be how you'd expand on a category and kind of the and sideways be the different categories. So um, the current default layout that we have is very much kind of like a Fitzgerald key and doesn't necessarily perfectly accommodate that particular organization. But if you imagine having, um, you know, people words, uh, action words, uh, object words and place words, and then the other modifiers kind of either further to the left, uh, further to the right, and then maybe some other words further to the left. And then kind of, because they're hexagons, this is a nice property of hexagons, you can also go in the diagonal direction. And uh, that could be a way to expand on each of the categories while kind of re retaining a structure that's learnable. Got it. Yeah, we're, we're about to uh reach that crossroads ourselves. So that was a question that came up in the chat that was useful for me as well. Um, so can we talk about the actual buttons and the hardware of that? I know you've done quite a bit of work developing that. Uh, can you talk to us about how that's different from maybe the learning resources buttons and what you guys have been working on with that? Um, so when we, uh, one of the first requests we got, and we actually even Christina was interested in this at the time, uh, but certainly Alexis was. And when you've got a learner who has a lot of buttons, the buttons being as large as they are ends up becoming a big obstacle because they tend to, if you've got 78 buttons, it can take up your whole, you know, if you living room almost, right? So smaller buttons allow us to put a lot more words into the same space. And they also make it easier for your dog to kind of, they don't have to walk around as far of a space as kind of things are more available. And so uh, definitely having the buttons be smaller was one of the first goals that we had. 
Um, we've worked a lot with our manufacturer to make sure that the buttons are as clear as we possibly can make them. Uh, and that's just a constant process. So we're, we're continuously trying to make the sound quality better and better. Um, and how about like the force in which, in which you have to press the buttons? Right. So that was another big, um, that was another big goal that we had. We wanted to make sure that dogs, no matter how big or small they were, could be able to press the buttons. And we had been hearing that people who had very small dogs were having trouble with the, learning, the, the larger buttons. And then they were also having trouble with the more seasonality. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, they were having trouble pressing the buttons and they were, uh, they were even having tr trouble with our first, the first version of buttons, which are, which took like, I think around 500 grams to press. And now we've got it down to like two or 300 grams. So we're making it really easy to press these small buttons. Do you have any tips for someone who maybe this just came up in the chat, someone uh, who has a cat who is kind of struggling to get them to push hard enough to actually activate the button. Uh, any tips for navigating that? Um, that's a, I mean, that's a good question. I, uh, it's, I, I, that's, a, I don't know. That's a, I, I honestly, I, I can't, I've had, this is the kind of trouble that I've had with my own cats, sure. you know, like it's not, it's not, I've not been, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. you're still developing the technology to, yeah. to make that a little bit easier. Um, mm -hmm. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. I probably just target practice. Um, I would say so. Yeah. Target practice um, and just like keep at it. Um, make sure it's a thing that the, the cat really wants that, you know, that they, they'd be able to get with the button. That actually reminds me of another question that we had, which was uh, transitioning from modeling the behavior, which is, you know, pressing the button yourself before you do the activity mm -hmm. to the learner actually then adopting that behavior and uh, advocating for themselves. Well, what would you recommend for someone who might be having trouble with that transition? Maybe they're modeling over and over again, but their learner isn't really uh, pressing the buttons on their own. I mean, I, every story we've heard is that it's just a matter of patience. It's, you know, some people it's, I think we've heard stories of it being like a month or six weeks even of modeling outside before you get your first like request uh, for, to go outside. So um, that's, I mean, that's, you can't, you know, you can't speed these, speed these kinds of things up that much, right? You've got to make it sure it's the kind of thing that your learner wants. I mean, obviously keep the button in the place where, uh, where your dog would make the request anyway. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, th th those would be the, those would be the, the tips. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, a lot of patience. I've definitely, uh, found that to be, to be helpful. Patience. I mean, patience is one of the first, I, we were talking in the, one of the, during the first test pilots meetings, and that was one of the biggest tips that we got from from all of you was just how long it can take you know especially if you're asking your learner to respond we're so used to responding you know really quickly uh one you know within a half second sometimes people even interrupt right with uh what we've seen with dogs is they can take sometimes as much as like 45 seconds uh to respond when you ask them to and if you interrupt their thinking process, sometimes they 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 it seems like it stresses them out. They get like flustered. They don't, you know, it ends up resetting the clock. They got to go and, you know, spend another 45 seconds thinking about how to respond. So it's it, patience is really, really the key thing here. Their brains <laughs> aren't as big as ours, unfortunately. <laughs> so I think that, you know, in knowing that, that's something that actually I picked up on early on as being something that was really interesting um, was the processing time it takes. That, mm -hmm. that, that's something that you guys were, um, were specifically looking for. How long does it take between, you know, asking your mm -hmm. learner to um, communicate with you versus when they actually do? Um, yeah. And we were finding that like, uh, and uh, you were sent, you, you and others were sending us these great videos where you actually recorded the amount of time involved. That was one of the first, um, kind of pilot studies that we did. And uh, we were finding it was generally at least 10 seconds um, and sometimes as many as like 40. So so recording, those recordings have proven to be very helpful 
Um, yes. yes. What, what would you recommend um, for someone to, to ta- kind of chart their own learner's progress? We, uh, I mean, we definitely recommend that people record their, uh, their sound, their soundboard. It's, uh, it's really valuable to have an always on recording on your soundboard because there are going to be things that you would miss otherwise. And those can be really frustrating because you'll say, oh, like they said this forward sentence and I just didn't capture it. Uh, now you've got the, you've got the proof, you know, uh, so having the ability to, uh, to kind of do that and go back and then also to track and see maybe if they're using the soundboard when you're not around. Um, that's, uh, that's really valuable. Mm-hmm. We'll be providing more instructions for people that end up participating in the video aspect of the study that we're doing that at, they can talk. There's basically, um, uh, there's kind of three levels of participation. There is, you know, the initial intake and, uh, submitting, kind of submitting regular updates. Uh, and we'll have more on that in the next uh, few weeks. So that's kind of the most basic level of participation and it's still extremely valuable to us. So don't feel like you need to get, get any further than that if, you don't, if, if you're not interested in it. But then the next level of participation is uh, going to be video oriented, which will involve uh, people capturing video of their dog using the sound bu- uh, soundboards, ideally on a semi mostly continuous basis. Um, and then the third level of interaction will be, and this will be done with a very small number of uh, participants, and that will be um, some kind of testing of your learner where, you know, this, this will obviously be for the most advanced learners, but it'll be something where we run a, a little study and we, we try something out and we see how the dog responds. So it sounds like people can use this platform that you guys created, theycantalk.org, to both chart their own progress and also get some community guidance. Um, what are some other uses for that site? Yeah, the, so there's theycantalk.org, which um, which we created in June, and we haven't, uh, and we've been updating uh, progressively uh, over time. But then we also started uh, how.theycantalk.org, which is the actual uh, kind of interactive user community. It's being uh, run by uh, my good friend Kelly, and uh, uh, there people can uh, talk with each other, uh, share. Uh, you know, what's working, what's not. Uh, and in particular, and this is my most, uh, my, my favorite part of the site is the that's interesting section where people will say things like, oh, my, uh, my dog was trying to communicate with the other dog in the house or with the cat or um, my dog, I, I went and asked him what he said and he repeated himself. He, he, he had done like mom play outside and, uh, originally and then when I came back and I said, what did you say? He said, mom, play outside. And so those kinds of, those kinds of things that show us that it's not just random, you know, button mashing that your learner is doing, those things are just, are super fascinating to us. So you've read probably quite a few anecdotes about, <laughs> about this, um, which is probably why we all think you have the answers, even though it is very early in the, in the research, as you said. Yeah. Um, does it, a couple of questions. Uh, does it matter if the learner uses their nose or their paw to activate the button? Have you noticed any patterns with that? Uh, it, it seems to vary. Um, both? Yeah, it, but dogs will use both. Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly, at least in principle, it should be easier for them to use their paw because they don't have to move their body as much. Um, and you know they can they can have in their peripheral vision the next paw the next paw the next button they want to touch, uh, but uh, but we see plenty of them using their noses like as well. Nose as well. Yeah. And um, is it important for the board to be accessible from all sides? I know, especially early on, when many of us were using uh, cardboard <laughs> pieces of cardboard, we'd push them against the wall, and ha- you know, then our learner was looking at the wall and pressing these buttons. Uh, how important is it for a dog, or I'm sorry, for the learner to be able to walk completely around the board? We were f- hearing from you that certain uh, that by having the buttons in like a square, your learners were prioritizing just the buttons that were on the periphery and they didn't really want to go uh, to the interior, which actually lines up with the notion that it's just harder to remember things when they're all kind of in a, in a, just a square 
arrangement. Uh, so they were really, they were really f f picking favorites and those favorites were just the things that were most accessible. So um, having access, uh, kind of maximizing the surface area a little bit of your, uh, of your soundboard seems like it could be helpful to learners to avoid kind of having them pick favorites that are kind of based on things that somewhat arbitrary, which is the, the button's position. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we see learners will, uh, you know, this is very clear in the case of Bunny, they'll uh, press a button or they'll press some phrase, you know, one, two, three, four, five button presses in the case of, again, in the case of Bunny, and then they'll look at their, you know, at mom, right? After they've made that, that press. And so if the board is facing the wall, it's a little bit, it's more work for them to like kind of look at mom than if it's kind of out from the wall a little bit and then they can press and even be watching as they're pressing to see, you know, what mom's reaction is. Mm. So it's definitely, you've seen it be more beneficial to have that full access. I don't know if the word's beneficial, but we've seen that, uh, learners look for the reaction as they're pressing. And if it's against the wall, that'll be harder yeah. for them to do. Got it. That makes sense. Um, can you talk about the the learning curve? Like with learners, does it get easier over time? Is it the first few buttons that are just really tough? And then, or are they all kind of like that? It's been our experience that the first few buttons are definitely the trickiest because uh, they're they're learning a lot, right? They're not just learning what the buttons mean, but they're learning that buttons mean something. And that's a whole, that's a, like kind of a meta level uh, learning that your learners engaged in. And so kind of once they get that they can use buttons to say what they want or to express themselves, it's, you know, adding buttons subsequent to that is, is a lot easier. Um, so I would say that uh, near as we can tell, uh, buttons, uh, it gets easier uh, to teach your learner. And um, especially if you're following their lead and paying attention to the things that they want um, and are asking for, uh, it, it ends up being, it seems like it ends up being a, a, a fairly fast process once, once we get going. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, I've, I can relate to that. That has been my experience as well, that the first few were, took a long time. And then after that, it's like they're hungry for, for more words. To... Yeah, we were seeing lots of examples where, um, and this to me is another, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to ex fully understand what's going on, but when we would get reports from, from you and others in the test pilot group where people were saying, um, oh, my, my learner has stopped, stopped pressing buttons. And, uh, what we heard was that actually, if you add more buttons, like one or two more buttons, that they'll end up getting interested in it again and they'll start, maybe they'll experiment a little bit and they'll start using the board again. So um, ironically, uh, obviously you don't wanna overwhelm your learner, but ironically adding a little bit more difficulty, uh, you know, because obviously now there's more buttons to choose from, seems like it can really, um, it can really actually trigger more use. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so how about in, um, from what you've seen, everything that you've read, all the people you are hearing from on a daily basis, um, how about people in a two animal household? Uh, mm -hmm. Like what, what have you seen there? That's been really interesting. We've, I mean, inevitably one learner is going to be more precocious than the other when it comes to using the buttons that is just biology. Right. Um, and so currently what seems to work best is you focus on the learner who's doing the best. And uh, what you can then take advantage of is the fact that dogs will learn through mimicry. And so they will watch the learner who's doing, uh, who's using the buttons and that'll help them figure out how they too can use them. So don't feel too, mu too bad about like kind of being held back necessarily by um, the learner who is maybe proceeding a little bit more slowly, focus on the one who's doing well and, you know, uh, allow the other learner to watch and, you know, hopefully they too will jump in and start pressing buttons. We've, we've seen a lot other reports of, you know, one learner will be using it for months and then a cat or a dog that was nearby will, will kind of take an interest and start pressing buttons themselves. Uh, have you had any, uh, any stories about, animals that are learners um, 
that are maybe talking for the other learner who maybe doesn't know how to use the buttons yet? We've heard lots of reports of that. I mean, it's so hard to say. Those are, but they're of course some of the most provocative stories. Um, when we, I mean, one of the most interesting ones, and I wish I could remember which dogs were involved, but uh, one dog who wasn't using the buttons uh, apparently needed to go out. And the other one said, you know, say Roxy needs to go out. Um, and then sure enough, uh, you know, mom opened the door, uh, Roxy goes out and the one who pressed the buttons didn't go out. Right? Like, first of all, like think about that for a moment. If that's in fact what happened, not only would uh, Roxy, not only would the, the learner who pressed the buttons have to kind of have grokked, have understood the fact that Roxy had this inclination, um, but then they would have also have to known that they should communicate it to their owner and uh, to the other person. And not only that, but uh, thirdly, like how would the first dog know that Roxy needed to go out, right? Like, if, how, like what were the clues, you know, that were obvious there? Like all of these questions suddenly appear uh, with every single one of these kind of interesting examples. Every interesting example raises like 20 different questions, um, which is why this is so interesting to me and, and, and Federico and others. Uh, do you, is there an eventual goal with this research or are you just kind of marching forward and seeing what happens? We would like to at, like figure out one way or the other, at, like in the near term, is this, is this real, right? Like, and once it's real, like how real is it? I would say those are like the two kind of near term goals. And there's a bunch of kind of so dimensions to that, that we can maybe explore. But then going forward, I mean, I don't think this is going to, I mean, assume if the answer is yes to those questions, right? Uh, to the first of those questions, this is going to be a, a much larger research program, I suspect. And we we no doubt will not be the only teams interested in asking these kinds of questions and exploring here. So this would be a, a much bigger undertaking. And uh, we hope that the data we're collecting now will allow that help, like that to proceed as quickly as possible. Uh, so a question that just came in from the chat, um, are you finding that learners are requesting things or are they more so describing their environment or surroundings, like narrating? Uh-huh, we're, so one of the things we ask people to report uh, as, as they're participating, as they are, as a participant in the They Can Talk kind of research project is uses by their dog of particular buttons. And the, we ask people to say what their belief is of what kind of a request, or I should say, what kind of a expression did your dog make? So was it a request? Was it a narration? Was it, um, was it there to inform you? Uh, because those are different, right? Uh, narrating that, you know, if mom's in the kitchen, uh, you know, making dinner or whoever is making dinner, dad's in the kitchen making dinner um, uh, and dog says, you know, dinner, right? Uh, you, the learner isn't saying anything that, you know, mom and dad don't already know, right? They're the ones in the kitchen making dinner. On the other hand, if uh, the dog says like, here's something outside and says like bird or stranger, right? That is uh, not a narration so much as it's, an, it's a telling whoever is around them, oh, there's this new piece of information that I have. Um, previously, they would have done this by barking, uh, right? Which is, you know, uh, has its drawbacks, but uh, maybe with the soundboard, you know, they'll be able to do that in a way that's a little bit more um, clear. Yeah. That's that's what I keep saying with with my soundboard. I'm like, yep, eventually she won't bark. She'll just let me know what she wants. Uh, that's, but yeah, that's hope we see. So we see, you know, there's you know, informing, narrating, requesting, and experimenting seem to be the kind of big four categories. And there might be a fifth category, which is communicating for others. But who knows whether there's oh, a fifth category? Yeah, interesting. So you're finding you're finding that all of these um, anecdotes that you're collecting fit into one of those five categories. It seems like they do. And um, Federico will be able to say more on this, but there, there are, you know, uh, I, theories, uh, linguistic 
uh, in, within linguistics, there are ideas that that's kind of the four fundamental kinds of communication that there are. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm botching this, so don't quote me on this. We'll have to bring on um, a speech pathologist to uh, to answer some of those questions. <laughs> yeah, well, I suspect uh, some smart, smart actual linguists and not you know pretend linguists will have yeah. uh, have something more to say on this kind of a topic. Um, so another question from uh, the chat, and this might be more um, again more <laughs> suited for a linguist. But uh, if someone wanted to read something to begin to understand the cognitive science behind the research, where would you recommend they begin? Oh gosh, um, I I would say having you know I've taken a number of linguistics courses. I would say that those would be pretty valuable. Um, uh, basic intro cognitive psychology courses would be valuable. Um, I've always, you know, found like the the history of uh, linguistics to be particularly interesting. Um, yeah. Understanding too, like the language books on like the origins of language would be would be compelling. Uh, one of the books that I read earlier in this work, this is actually even before uh, the whole Fluent Pet project came about, but was uh, it was about a man, it was about a woman who was trying to teach a man who had not had any language ability because he was, he was deaf and he was not raised in a, in a signing household. Uh, I wish I could remember the name of the book, but she had been uh, trying to work with this man and teach him how to speak even though he was in his thirties, right? Or his twenties or thirties. So he's like, you know, a fully an adult and, and kind of seeing, being able to kind of put yourself in the mind of, of, of a, a learner who doesn't have language as she constantly had to do uh, is I think a particularly valuable way of empathizing maybe with your learner. And now in that case, it's not formal cognitive science. This is just a, an extended case report but um, I did find it pretty valuable to read. So it sounds like the, the fundamentals of communication and cognitive science is the same for this kind of work as it would be with a child or someone who's nonverbal or. I, so one of the things you learn very early on when you study something like cognitive science, which was, is just my background, um, is that the like, Interspecies differences are are interesting, um, almost like almost as though they're the exceptions that prove the rule that at least among mammals, m most of the way that cognition works is relatively the same. You know, at the fine grained level of uh, cognition, the way we all you know all mammals have neurons, uh, neurons all communicate in roughly the same ways. We all have like structures uh, that you know all mammals have cortex, you know, chances are cortex relates to the rest of the brain in roughly similar ways, you know, we, so for the most part, you know, the way thinking and cognition works is probably mostly the same from, certainly from mammal to mammal. Um, and then, and then the question becomes kind of, well, what is it that humans do that makes us so much more capable than a dog or a cat or a dolphin or uh, a lemur, you know? Um, and, and my answer to that question is we've been able to accumulate knowledge from one generation to the next, right? Whereas mm -hmm. most of the stuff that a cat learns, you know, disappears, um, you know, after the cat is gone. Uh, so, um, so the ability to pass down that information exactly and accumulate it right and write things down is really writing things down is really helpful so uh that so the analogy i like to give is like you know what's the difference between like a human and a cat it's kind of like the same question is like what's the difference between you know apple corporation and your corner store right they're both kind of fundamentally the same thing right they um they try and make money by selling things to people and they have people involved, you know, there's someone behind a counter in one, in one case, and there's like two people or, you know, tens of thousands in the case of like a big company like Apple. But, you know, if you gave the corner store the kind of project that you might ask Apple to do, they just would totally fall on their face, right? But that doesn't mean that if you 
provided the right context and culture and training and time to the people that were operating the corner store yeah. that they might subsequently be able to do the kinds of things that a big corporation can do. Mm -hmm. So, so we're trying to uh, equip our learners <laughs> with as much information as possible to be as successful in this as possible. Um, in terms, of going back to the the research um, and logging process, uh, what what other information is useful for you right now? Like, what what do you want to know from people who are doing this? Um, well, I mean, most of what we're trying to figure out is is captured by the logging. Um, uh, we, I think one of the things we want to do more of on the forum is have conversations about what is like a, an interesting behavior by a learner and what is maybe just kind of random. Um, and enabling us to kind of, us kind of as the community of people that are doing this with learners, to be able to kind of more clearly distinguish and kind of call out things that are provocative and really compelling, you know, and then writing them down, like maybe in a post or as part of an update, that's, you know, that's what I think we're, we're most interested in seeing happen in, at this stage. Mm -hmm. Eventually, of course, we'll want to integrate that with, you know, captured video and whatnot. But at this stage, you know, having these reports, they are what, um, will end up driving the third stage of the research that we're doing where we're actually testing uh, and seeing how different learners respond to different kind of cues and contexts and stimuli. So we talked a little bit about how a beginner might get started. Uh, let's say your learner knows the basics. Uh, this came from our chat. Someone wants to know uh, how, how we go about teaching more abstract concepts like concern, mad, or mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. The the approach there is to is to really be patient and wait for the context to present itself when that word would be useful. So introduce the word that you're interested in modeling and having them learn. So whether it's maybe it's uh, want, right? And then uh, and then wait. And then when there's a time when your learner might want something. Uh, the one report we have is uh, that someone, uh, a, a learner had lost their toy underneath the couch and had gone to the, to the, to mom and said, you know, you know, my, my thing is underneath the couch. And then mom went and said like, want, you know, whatever the toy was and, and then provided the toy. And, you know, that, that is now a contextually appropriate, you know, modeling event. The, the, the learner has their emotional state now connected to the use of the button and their, their need is fulfilled. And so the kind of, when those things are all in place, I think we see learning happening a lot more quickly. So the, it's really important, I think, to not be too prescriptive in the way that you're using buttons. This is not, you're not trying to teach them to play the button game. Uh, you don't want it to feel artificial. You want it to be a thing that the uh, that is a part of your learner's you know experience of everyday life. So theoretically, then <clears throat> this way of communicating, I mean, do you have reason to believe that it could eventually help with maybe a dog that's more anxious or um, a dog with more challenging behaviors, kind of? funnel that into um, a more productive way to communicate? I mean, we've heard, as, as you probably know, from other uh, other kind of members of the group that their people are reporting that their dogs are barking less when they have access to buttons. Um, I mean, of course, we're adding a lot of complexity, you know, by, by adding buttons. And so maybe that would mean sometimes they'll bark more, right? You know, because they're now talking about bigger things. But um, it's certainly the case that when you're not being understood is one of the most frustrating experiences anyone can have, as people will probably can remember from their own kind of own lives. When someone is not hearing you, it, it can be pretty infuriating. And so that might be what a, a lot of dogs barking is actually all about, is they're like, why are you not 
getting what I need right now. Um, and so maybe this would be a way of alleviating that. Well, I guess uh, time, time will tell, right? <laughs> exactly. We sure hope so. Well, this has been absolutely amazing. Um, we've gotten through some really great questions from our community, some great questions from our chat. Um, I personally feel like I have a little bit of a better understanding moving forward with my learner. Uh, hopefully our audience does as well. Um, and thank you so much for uh, spending this hour with us. Thank you, Rachel. This is really fun. <laughs>